Module 8, Multilane Design. The principles and design process described previously apply to multilane roundabouts, but in a more complex way. We now have multiple traffic streams that may enter, circulate through, and exit the roundabout side by side, and the designer needs to consider how these traffic streams interact with each other. The geometry should provide adequate alignment and establish appropriate lane configurations for vehicles in adjacent entry lanes to be able to negotiate the roundabout geometry without competing for the same space. So if not, we could have operational and or safety deficiencies. Balancing capacity, safety, property impacts, and costs become more difficult with multi-lane roundabout designs. Geometry, pavement markings, and signing must be designed together to create a comprehensive system to guide and regulate road users who are traversing roundabouts. Some additional key considerations for all multi-lane roundabouts. The lane arrangements to allow drivers to select the appropriate lane on entry and navigate through the roundabout without changing lanes. Alignment of vehicles at the entrance line into the correct lane within the circulatory roadway. Accommodation of side-by-side -side vehicles through the roundabout. Alignment of legs to prevent exit circulating conflicts. And accommodations for all travel modes. Lane arrangement. We need to ensure that the design provides the appropriate number of lanes within the circulatory roadway and on each exit to ensure lane continuity. Movements assigned to each entering lane are key to the overall design. Pavement markings are integral to the preliminary design process. And as the example shows here, uh, we have two lanes entering, two lanes circulating, but because the leftmost lane is a left only, we only need to have one lane exiting. Our inscribed circle diameter. Uh, we covered single lane roundabouts, which are largely dependent upon the, the turning requirements of the design vehicle. Once we get into multi-lane roundabouts, uh, it becomes deflection and speed control, adequate alignment of the natural vehicle pass, as well as accommodating the design vehicle. So for, for initial selection of the ICD, the design vehicle and context of location should be taken into consideration again. Uh, if you remember the urban locations, typically those lower speeds with uh, right-of-way constraints and you get out in those rural locations, those higher speeds with larger vehicles. Uh, so we're looking at multi-lanes in this particular section and we're in that 160 to 200 foot range with uh, 180 being a good, good place to start for a multi-lane roundabout. Entry width. The required width is dependent upon the number of lanes in the design vehicle. Typical width for a two lane entry ranges from 24 to 30 feet. Typical width for individual lanes at entry range from 12 to 15 feet. And the typical widths with painted gores, you know, will have entry lanes in the 11 to 12 foot range and then gores uh, in the four to six foot range. We want to use painted gores when providing in-lane truck accommodations. Entry design. The entry curvature should balance the competing objectives of speed control, design vehicle accommodations, adequate alignment of natural paths, and the need to provide appropriate sight lines. So this may require several design iterations to identify the appropriate roundabout size, location, and approach of alignments. And that leads to multi-lane entry radii commonly in the 75 to 110 foot range. Path overlap. Designing multi-lane roundabouts is significantly more complex than single-lane roundabouts due to the additional conflicts present with multiple traffic streams in adjacent lanes while entering, circulating, and exiting. The natural path of a vehicle is the path that will take based on the speed and orientation imposed by the roundabout geometry. Path overlap occurs when the natural paths of vehicles in adjacent lanes overlap or cross one another, as shown in the graphic to the right. The entry design should align vehicles into the appropriate lane within the circulatory roadway. A good design is going to balance entry speed and path alignment. And while this is common on entries, it may also occur on exits. 
So here's an example of a good design where vehicles on the approach are directed into the appropriate lane within the circulatory roadway. So this design does not have path overlap. Here's a nice graphic that shows the vehicles at the yield line waiting to enter into the roundabout. And you can see how they are directed into the appropriate lanes within the circulatory roadway. And just another view of a similar type of an example. Again, vehicles at the yield line directed into the appropriate circulatory roadway lanes. Here's an example of um, some issues with, with path overlap. You can see this particular entry where this vehicle is actually directed really towards the center island, so they have to kind of work to get over into the left most circulatory lane where it's actually easier for the vehicle in the rightmost lane to get into that lane as well. So at the entry here, you're going to have issues with vehicles in both lanes, not sure where they're supposed to go, and this will impact uh, operations at this particular roundabout. Another example here, we can see if we were to take the, the lane line between the two entering lanes and extend it into the roundabout, you can see that on these two particular entries that the rightmost lane is directed more into the left circulatory roadway lane and somewhat similar on the, the other approaches as well. So again, we're going to have operational and potentially safety issues at these roundabouts due to the poor entry design and the path overlap that exists. So as I had mentioned, it's not just on entries. We can also have it on, on exits as well. See the vehicle in the right lane. Uh, there's quite a bit of curvature on, on this particular exit, so they, they would stay in their lane. But it actually would be easier for the vehicle on the inside lane to use that outside lane on exit as well. So we need to make it comfortable for the vehicles to, to exit out of the roundabout as well. So here's again that same example showing vehicle in the rightmost lane and then the vehicle on the left circulatory lane. Again, easier for them to, to exit out into that rightmost lane. So how do we check for path overlap? Well, this is from the, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation's FDM, and they show by providing a tangent in between the entry and circulatory roadway and they have some dimensions here specified 26 foot minimum or 40 to 50 foot desirable uh, we can do that so within the when we have our multi-lane designs and we've got our our two-lane entry two lanes circulating we can if we provide that tangent and we want to extend that typically to the the tangent point near that yield line or if not a little bit further back into to that entry and the same thing on the exit as well. We want to provide a, a section of tangent in there between our two curves. Circulatory roadway width is usually governed by the type of vehicles that need to be accommodated adjacent to one another. Typical lane widths range from 12 feet to 18 feet, and the typical total circulating width ranges from 28 to 32 feet. The outside lane is typically larger and you do not have to provide consistent lane widths within the circulatory roadway. They don't both need to be 15 feet. This provides additional space for the larger vehicles that tend to be in the right lane. It also improves your entry and exit path tangents, and it improves the appearance of the circulatory lane widths uh, from the uh, yield line. The circulatory roadway width does not need to remain constant. We want to provide only the minimum width necessary to serve the required lane configuration. So our example here that the major movement east-west has two lanes and the minor movement may only have one lane circulating. So again just because you have two lanes entering at one entry doesn't mean the entire circulatory roadway needs to be two lanes. In some instances, the circulatory roadway width may actually need to be wider than the corresponding entrance that is feeding that portion of the roundabout. For example, in situations where two consecutive entries require exclusive left turns, a portion of the circulatory roadway will need to contain an extra lane and spiral marking to enable all vehicles to reach their intended exits without being trapped or changing lanes. 
spirals. A spiral transition leads drivers into the appropriate lane for their desired exit, and they enable vehicles to reach their intended exit without being trapped or needing to change lanes. Uh, spirals tend to work better or they're more efficient on larger circles where spiral curves are longer. And we want to avoid the use of spiral designs unless it's clearly warranted by traffic. Spirals do add complexity and sometimes a little bit of driver confusion. So don't use them unless needed. Again, here's another graphic showing where we have a left turn only which requires us then to take a driver going northbound and push them into that outer lane so that they can reach their exit without being trapped. So spirals are developed with uh, two semicircles with, with different diameters, as you can see with the, the green here and then the orange as well. And then there's also a section of tangent, which is, which is shown in purple. Spirals should be developed from the central island with curb and gutter. If not, vehicles tend to, to drive over the pavement marking as shown in this particular example. So we wanna make those uh, spiral transitions out of curb and gutter to ensure that we get vehicles to go in their intended paths. And here's a nice picture of a roundabout that is ready to be open to traffic and you can see that there's a spiral incorporated within this design. Exit design. As with the entries, the design of exit curvature is more complex at multi-lane roundabouts. Conflicts can occur between exiting and circulating vehicles if appropriate lane assignments are not provided. Exit radii are usually larger than the entry radii and are typically used to promote good vehicle path alignment. We need to Balance that by the need to maintain slow speeds through that pedestrian crossing on exit. A picture here of a curvilinear exit design. So there's just a little more curvature on, on these exits. And this picture shows a, a larger radius exit type of design or more of a straight out type of, of exit. So it does provide good sight of the crosswalk with no exit path overlap, but there will be higher exit speeds. A highly curved exits may shadow pedestrians from multi-lane exiting traffic. So I have a little example here of a pedestrian that's in the crosswalk. We got a car that's circulating in the outside lane. They may come up to the crosswalk and yield to the pedestrian. The pedestrian may start walking out into the into that crosswalk. The blue car here is in the, the left lane circulating. Well, that car may shadow that pedestrian and they may not be able to see them. And as that vehicle comes around, the potential for a pedestrian crash there because they could not see the, see the pedestrian. So that's some of the issues that you may uh, run into with highly curved exits. In addition, highly curved exits may also have path overlap. And again, you can see at this location that if you're in that left lane circulating, it's gonna be pretty easy to, to cross over into that rightmost exit lane. Exit tapers. Tippering the number of lanes on an exit from two lanes to one lane allows for additional capacity without excessive mid-block widening. Roundabout's continuous flow typically results in less saturated traffic streams exiting, and speeds are much slower exiting roundabouts, which eliminates the need for long parallel section downstream of an exit. So design exit tapers based on the anticipated in lane exiting speed, not the fastest path. And that's typically between 15 and 25 miles per hour. And this graphic is again from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, FDM. And you can see the ability to take two exiting lanes and taper them back into a single lane fairly quickly. We just wanna uh, be aware that the further the full lane width is provided, or extended downstream, the higher the, the speeds and the potential for longer merging tapers. So the further you get it away from the roundabout, the higher the speeds and the longer the taper that you're gonna need to provide. Here's an example of an exit taper, and you can see the ability to take those two lanes and merge them down into one. Separation between legs. Problems can occur when the design allows for too much separation between entries and subsequent exits. Large separations between legs causes 
entering vehicles to join next to circulating traffic that may be intending to exit at the next leg, rather than crossing the path of the exiting vehicles. This can create conflicts at the exit points between exit and circulating vehicles. A solution is illustrated below, which involves realignment of the approach legs to have the paths of the entering vehicles cross the paths of the circulating traffic rather than merging to eliminate the conflict.